My message is a Christmas message, I promise. It's not going to feel like it in the beginning. You're going to be like, wow, this doesn't feel Christmassy, but it is. I, I give you my guarantee that there's a Christmas element to this message, but uh, did any of you know that I was a dairy farmer at one point? I used to milk cows. I didn't really like it, not my profession, not what I'm supposed to be doing, but there's one thing about dairy farming that I did not like the most. Cows, the, the, the milking never stops. Cows don't care if it's Christmas. They don't care if it's Christmas. And the Holy Spirit kind of operates in the same modem. He's, he's the Holy Spirit speaking fresh revelation when it's not Christmas and when it is Christmas. So it's, it's dangerous to, to try to put his word into a Christmas box that doesn't represent what he's doing. Does that make sense? So this is a Christmas message. The, me- the title of my message is Overcoming a Jealous Spirit, which doesn't feel very Christmassy, I understand. But we, I, I think we've read through like three different books in our life journal this week. And we read through James and James 3 talks about the spirit of jealousy, and that just got me this week, just completely grabbed me. Then I had like three or four different conversations on that topic uh, with no, uh, not trying to like talk about it with anybody, it just happened spontaneously. And so I felt like the Lord really wanted me to address the spirit of jealousy this morning. Uh, so it won't feel like Christmas on the front end, but just hang in there. It's going to get there. We're going to talk about some Christmas stuff. But if you, if you will, go with me to James 3, verse 13. How many of you know that jealousy within itself is not evil? Did you know that? Exodus 34, God says, I am the Lord. My name is jealous. Do you know that there's a godly form of jealousy? Do you know that the only reason that you're saved the only reason that you know Jesus, the only reason you have the opportunity to hear this through reborn ears is because of God's jealous love for you. If not for jealousy, you wouldn't be saved. God was so jealous that you would know him and that you would forsake your foreign idols, forsake your foreign gods, that he came to earth in human form and then died on your behalf. So jealousy in itself is not evil, But if you're not in partnership with the Holy Spirit, you are, um, how can I put this? There is an opportunity for the spirit of jealousy to dominate your life. See, there's a difference between jealousy from God's jealous love and the spirit of jealousy. Does that make sense? See, God's jealousy is, is motivated by love. It's motivated by love. God loves you so jealously that he gave his life for you. John 3, 16. The spirit of jealousy is motivated by fear. It's motivated by fear. The spirit of jealousy makes you look towards another for satisfaction in what God has already promised to you. Does that make sense? So jealousy is, is, a, is a motivation. Actually, one of the words for jealousy in the, in the Greek lexicon or the, the, the concordance would be heat, because jealousy burns within us. It actually causes us to make thoughts, thought patterns, decisions, actions based on what we're feeling on the inside. So if I'm jealous of what somebody else is doing, that's going to cause a motivation in me to happen, to burn within me, to make me do things I wouldn't do if I was in submission to God's jealous love for my life. See, a jealous spirit comes from being rebellious towards God's love indwelling in you. We make space for a spirit of jealousy when we're motivated to care for ourselves. In essence, we believe we are our own God. The result of this attitude looks like being in competition of what God is doing in other people. See, when I'm, when I'm jealous of what God is doing in other people, I'm in competition with them. Most of the things that you'll miss out of, out from, that God wants to do in your life will be a result of you being distracted of what he's doing in another person. 
I'm going to go through this slow. There's a lot of notes, and I want to go through this slow so you can think about it, because I, I think this is going to, this is something that I deal with too. So it's, again, not directing this towards any one person, but if you don't address this, you'll never walk in what God has called you to walk in. You'll always be distracted. So go to James 3, verse 13, and I promise it's a Christmas message. <laughs> Just keep saying that. <laughs> If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Remember those three keys. Such things are earthly unspiritual and demonic. And I think this is in the NLT, and that's probably in the New King James, so wording might be a little bit different. But it's the same meaning. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, of every, there you will also find disorder and evil of every kind. Okay. So humility looks like wisdom. Wisdom looks like living out the faith that's inside of you. How many of you know there's a burden for each one of us to actually live out the call that God has put inside of you and to do it not only with obedience, but wisdom. God requires that we would walk in wisdom. How do we obtain wisdom? James goes on to teach it later in the book. He says, any of you who may lack wisdom, what do you need to do? Just ask for it. It's very simple. He just says, grab onto it. Take what I've already given to you. So there's a burden on our life to respond to God's call and to his love with obedience and wisdom. A spirit of jealousy and bitter ambition is actually a counterfeit of wisdom. Why is it a counterfeit of wisdom? Because it seems right. It seems like it's going to get us where we want to go, but it actually destroys what God is doing within us. See, when, I, when I'm motivated by jealousy, when I'm motivated by my own bitter ambitions, I'm actually missing out on what God has called me to do. I may feel like I'm heading in the right direction, but I'm actually on a path of self-destruction. That's what James is saying, that jealousy and bitter ambition is actually a path of self-destruction. James teaches, instead of trying to cover it up and act like everything's okay, be honest with yourself. Address it. Isn't that crazy? Just address the brokenness within you. How many of you know a lot of us spend our whole lives trying to avoid the brokenness when all you need to do is just address it? Here's a, a pro tip. All of us are broken. All of us struggle with jealous feelings. All of us struggle with selfish ambition. There's not a single one of us that are exempt from what James is talking about. James is not saying if you don't get perfect, you won't be right before the Lord. He says just address it. Just quit pretending like you don't deal with it. That way you can move into what God has called you. According to James, be motivated by a jealous spirit rather than God's jealous love does these three things to you. It submits you to the world or weakens your testimony. Did you know that when we conform to the world, our testimony dries up? You're not supposed to look like the world. You're supposed to be a little different. You're supposed to be a little weird. You're supposed to be a little bit unpalatable to the, the conformity of the world. But when you conform to the world, you actually weaken the testimony that God has put in you. Number two, it empowers your flesh. It empowers your flesh. What happens when our flesh is empowered? We're susceptible to sin. It's very simple. We can't with, with strain ourselves. Temptation dominates us. When we're living a jealous and uh, a bitterly selfish life, we're, we're actually empowering, empowering our flesh. And when we empower our flesh, we're susceptible to sin. And what's the wages of sin? Huh. It's a simple gospel, isn't it? Number three, it acts as a covering and a doorway to demonic power and influence in your life. It acts as a covering. This is jealousy, okay? When you're, when you're operating under a spirit of jealousy, you're, you're creating a doorway and a covering for demonic activity to influence and manipulate your life. 
Those are not good things, by the way. (laughs) As James explains, jealousy will rob you of the work and destiny that God has called you to. He goes on to explain, verse 17, how to deal with a jealous spirit and move forward in our work and plan as Jesus has called us to. So verse 17, but wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and will willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the, fruit, and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism. It is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So again, it's not that you deal with jealousy. It's not that you deal with selfish ambition. It's how you deal with the way you feel. Okay? It's how you deal with the way you feel. So James is not saying you, if you're If you're not able to to not be jealous, you're disqualified from the kingdom. He goes, no, no, you're going to deal with it, so deal with it the right way. And he says, be peace-loving. Pursue peace. Pursue peace. Just pursue relationships with peace. Don't be quick-tempered. Don't be be willing to just jump in and start a fire in every every conflict. Be peace-loving. He says, be gentle and patient at all times. Man, that's so counterintuitive to our culture. We just want to go, 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 do what we have to do. He says, no, 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 slow down. Be gentle. Be patient with whom God has brought to you. Allow your love to develop in the bonds that I've made for you. Allow me to be evident through your patientness. <laughs> we don't think about it sometimes, but being patient is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You're building the kingdom of God through your life when you're patient with other people. It's Christmas time, so your family's coming, right? <laughs> you want to build the kingdom? You want to display the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Just be patient. You don't have to be right. You don't have to get your way. You don't have to dominate conversations. You don't have to have people see things the way you see them, but you do need to be patient. Yield to other people, serving and choosing to submit to other people's preferences over your own. It's true. If, if you don't know how to serve from obedience, you're not actually serving. Servants that points ba- service that points back to you is not serving. That's transactioning. <laughs> That's bartering. That's getting what you need from doing something to either impress people or impress yourself. It's not impressive to God. He doesn't need you to barter. Serving is being obedient and saying, Lord, what do you expect from me? What are you asking of me? What are you sending me to these people to give away? How are you using me to impact people with your love and then being obedient to do so? That's what serving is. Not showing favoritism, not making social clicks, and working towards being sincere in all of our relationships. How about just not being fake? Just not being fake. Isn't that the plague of the, the modern church, just fake people, and we're all sick of it? We all know. Nobody's fooled by the fake. The fake falls off eventually. Obviously, none of us are perfect. We all succumb to a spirit of jealousy. Again, it's not that you do. It's how you deal with it when it happens. God has given you a plan, and walking in a spirit of jealousy will actually divert you from the plan that he's called you to. God's plans are always good for us. They're always perfect for us. But sometimes they're difficult to see, especially when you're focused on what he's doing in another person rather than being consumed what he's called you to. (laughs) And in our American church culture, we're more connected than we've ever been in the history of the church. Are we not? It's amazing. You can go online and see what God is doing all over the world in a matter of seconds. A matter of, I think it's incredible. I love it. I'm not against it. I think it's a blessing from God so that we would be a more unified church. But what's the trap in that? That you would be more concerned with what God is doing in someone else over there than being obedient in what He's called you to over here. It's true. True. If you're, if you're just full of info of what God is doing all over the place and you're, and you're celebrating what God is doing in all these different directions, but you're not being obedient to what he's called you to here, you might actually be dealing with a, a jealous spirit. See, what is jealousy? It's actually rebellion towards what God has put in you. I'll try that one more time. Jealousy is actually rebellion 
towards what God has put in you because you're jealous of what he's doing in somebody else. A great way to cover up selfish ambition is to be excited about what God is doing everywhere else, but be totally rebellious to what he's called you to and the place that he's put you with the people that he's called you to be in relationship with. <laughs> Again, I'm not, I'm not like trying to, to mock being excited about what God is doing all over the world. I'm thankful. I'm thankful we're connected all over the, the globe, different continents, Africa, South Sudan, unreached people groups. But as excited as I am about what God is doing there, I need to be diligent and obedient to what he's called us to. Same with you. What he's doing in another person should be a motivator for what's capable in you, not a barrier it's your choice to either ag to agree with a jealous spirit and defy God's love moving through you or saying, Lord, I see what you can do in another and I'm confident in what you're doing in me. I'll be obedient no matter the cost. When someone else succeeds at what God has called you to, you can either rebel or submit again. Jealousy looks and feels good in the moment and it's usually something we don't even realize has hold of us when it does. It's like unforgiveness. It's self-glorifying. It feels good in the moment. But if it goes unrestrained, it actually destroys you and can bring harm to the relationships you've been called to. This is demonstrated in, in two different stories, in the story of Herod and the story of Joseph. I told you we'd do some Christmas scriptures. We're going to do Matthew 1 and 2. And we're going to look at the life of Herod. We all know Herod is evil, so he's the bad guy. And we're going to look at Joseph, the one who was betrothed to Mary. Obviously, he's the good guy. Both of them dealt with opportunities to be jealous, but both of them dealt, dealt with it in different ways. Who do you think did it wrong? <laughs> Herod, right? All right, let's go to Matthew 2. We'll start with him. Matthew 2, verse 1. One, and I'm going to read uh, until I stop. <laughs> Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the king of Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is this newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In, the, in Bethlehem in Judah, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not, the, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will, be the shepherd, who will be the shepherd for my people. Then Herod called for a private meeting, verse 7, with the wise men, and he learned from them that the time when the star had first appeared. Then he told them, go back Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I may go worship too. Okay, we'll stop there. So why is, is Herod disturbed? He's jealous. There's some foreign dignitaries with expensive gifts coming from a distant land to honor and worship another king. And so he's jealous. What's jealousy it's motivated by? Fear. What, he's af what is he afraid of? He's afraid he's going to lose his title, his position, his power. And so he's motivated to do something about it. And what does he do? He manipulates the relationships around him, doesn't he? How many of you know that when you're operating under a jealous spirit, you will manipulate the relationships that God has brought into your life? So he manipulates them. He says, no, go out there and find the, the little fella. And then come back and tell me about him because I got some gifts too. I want to worship him. And the wise men, what does it say? The wise men go out. They find him. They worship. They give him the gifts. And then as they're about to go back to Herod, they're diverted by God. And they go a different direction. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter what spirit you're operating underneath. Doesn't matter how many relationships you manipulate. Doesn't matter how you feel about the situation. You can't stop God's plan from manifesting on the earth. You can either defy it or partner with it. And King Herod defied it. 
So instead of partnering with God's plan during his life, Herod submits to the spirit of jealousy, and here's a short list of his actions. He manipulates the relationships around him. He told the wise men to go because he wanted to worship. He didn't want to worship. He wanted to kill little baby Jesus. Two, he hurt and victimized the people God had called him to protect and to serve. What does Herod do to all the two-month-old babies after the wise men don't come back? He slaughters them. He has his soldiers go out and slaughter them. If you're operating on a jealous, jealous spirit, you may not feel like it because you think you can justify everything you do to protect what you think you have. <laughs> Can't you? But you end up hurting and, and, and maiming the people that God has brought you to. I know this seems like an extreme example, but this is just what jealousy does. And sometimes we think, if I can just get to the next station of power, if I could just get the responsibility if I want, if I can just get the title, then everything will be okay. But the truth is that responsibilities, power, and title doesn't make you deal with jealousy any better. In fact, title, responsibility, and power can make the effects of jealousy more severe to the relationships you've been called to. It's important that we have our identity secured in what God says about us and what he's doing in us so that we can partner with what he's doing in the world and not divert ourselves from it and hurt the people we've been called to. Again, like Herod, you can't stop the plan from happening, but you can cause a lot of pain and mess trying to defy him. (laughs) See, we all have families, whether you like it or not. That's the only thing you can't pick correct? You can choose who you're married to. In some ways, you get to choose your in-laws, but really, you don't choose your in-laws. You, you can uh, choose who your friends are, but you can't choose who your brothers and sisters are. You can choose who uh, you, you go to work with. You can choose who you go to your extracurricular activities with, but you can't choose who your family is. And sometimes we think we can control the narrative, control the relationships, make things happen the way we want them to happen. But the truth is, is when we try to control things, we end up hurting the people around us. We end up having a worse effect than what we meant for the people God has called us to. Okay, let's look at the good example example of responding to a spirit of jealousy in Matthew 1. This is Joseph. You guys okay? It's not, it's not, too, it's not Christmassy enough. <laughs> By the way, there's nothing in history that makes Christmas trees pagan or gift-giving pagan or any of the dumb uh, things that people say that try to uh, make Christmas time a pagan celebration. There's nothing in history that, that proves that. There's suggestions and a lot of historians, but there's no proof that anything we celebrate during Christmas time is pagan. I just wanted to make you mad if you believe that. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, you just Google it and read it yourself. Uh, Matthew 1, verse 18. I love you, by the way. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man who did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be a Afraid. What motivates jealousy? Fear. You know, there's two ways to read this, and I, I, I believe in both of them. The first way to read it would be the angel is like, hey, I'm an angel, and I don't want you to be afraid of me because historically when people have angel encounters, their bones shake and their brains explode, and they're just like, too much, too fast. But I also think he was saying to Joseph, hey, don't be afraid of what's happening. This is God. Because if you could imagine as a male with me just for a second, you're maybe just like Joseph. He's watching his favorite sports team try to make it into the playoffs, and he's just doing his thing, going to work, taking care of his family, preparing to marry to Mary. Mary. And all of a sudden, Mary comes over and is like, hey, we got to talk. I just took a pregnancy test. 
But before you freak out, <laughs> I want you to know this is God. How would you feel? Probably pretty jealous. Who did it? Show me the milkman, the postman, whoever it was, I'm ready to go get him. So the angel comes and he says, no, 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 don't be afraid because jealousy is motivated by fear. And so Joseph, being a reputable man who, who doesn't want to harm the relationships he's been called to steward, unlike Herod, considers what he should do next. There's that patience thing again, right? That gentleness that we read about. And he considers and he thinks, you know what? I don't want to be, I don't want to be that guy. Uh, you know, this is too Jerry Springer for me. This is not Christmas enough. And so I'm going to break this thing off. But I'm going to do it in a way that honors and respects the relationships I've been called to care for. And in the process of doing that, he makes space for God to speak to him again. Or to speak to him. See, sometimes... When hard stuff happens, when you feel that, that jealous ambition to, to change your circumstance, to, to make things happen for yourself, to, to take over what needs to be taken over, to control what needs to be controlled, the best thing you can do is just shut up and wait. Just shut up and wait. And that's what he does. He just considers. And his ability to consider, his ability to be patient, his ability to be gentle is what makes space for Jesus to be born. I'm going to just try this one more time. His ability to be gentle, patient, to consider, to wait on God, actually gives space for God's kingdom to be birthed through him. You know, another thing we do in the American church, we go from Activity to activity, activity, activity. We don't like it, so we'll do something different that doesn't work out the way we want, so I'll just find something else. I'll go from place to place to place to place. We move so fast, we don't give time for God to, to develop what he wants to do in our lives. Sometimes you just got to chill out. Sometimes you just got to submit yourself to people who you think are hurting you but aren't hurting you. Sometimes you got to allow yourself time to not be afraid and let the Lord show you that you are actually being mo motivated by a jealous spirit. You're, you're being motivated by selfish ambition instead of staying put and being obedient to what he called you to. <laughs> See, Joseph had every reason to be jealous and didn't, and he could have tried to defy God's plan, but he waited patiently. He gave up his own personal reputation and plans. He valued obedience over position, title, and personal ambition. Because of this, he's part of the greatest story ever told on earth. It never feels like it in the moment, but jealousy is a violation of your God-given identity and the story God has called you to. See, when you're operating in a jealous spirit, you are violating the, the story that God has called you to. Like unforgiveness, jealousy feels empowering and protecting, and it feels like you're, you're doing what's right for yourself, but it's actually hindering you from the call that God has put into your life. Jealousy takes the plan God meant to bless your life with and causes your heart to work against it. <laughs> I thought that was a good one. Jealousy takes the plan God meant to bless your heart, your life with, and purposes, purposes your heart to work against it. A jealous heart cannot perceive the good plans of God. Hmm. I'm going to skip some stuff. These are some points that I wrote down to further help you examine your heart to see if there's any jealousy you might need to deal with. Selfish ambition. It's one and the same. The, the core of it is fear and the desire to be one's own God. So just like Jeff Foxworthy has the, this is how you know you're a redneck. I have this is how you know that you're jealous. <laughs> you aren't happy for others when they achieve success. Another person's success makes you feel unhappy or changes your, your mood, your emotions. You feel the need to diminish what God is doing in other people, in other places. Again, these are things that I deal with from time to time as well. You're quick to judge people and critique them than you are to bless them and encourage them. 
You're happy when other people face setbacks. That's a short list. And I have a longer list of thought patterns on how to break a jealous spirit. So when I'm dealing with that, again, it's not, it's not that you do deal with it. It's what do you do with what you feel. Do we understand that? We all deal with jealousy. We all deal with selfish ambition. If you don't, you're just a liar. Sorry. It's the truth. What do you do with it? These are the things that I do. I remind myself of these things. I'm graced to be, so I'm empowered. Grace is an empowerment. Grace is not just a feeling God feels towards you like, oh, I forgive you, grace. No, grace is a power that moves from heaven onto earth. You are graced or empowered to be exactly where God has called you to be, and you are able to be successful in his plans for your life. I remind myself that I am my own worst enemy. Satan, neither Satan or any other person on earth has the power to diminish my worth or God's purpose for my life. The more I bless others, the more I'm better positioned to receive God's blessing in my life. Those who refresh will then be refreshed themselves. That's scripture. It's not prosperity gospel. The more you bless other people, the better positioned you are to receive God's blessing in greater proportion. Trying to imitate what God is doing in someone else is a waste of my time. God has gifts, grace, and destiny that fits perfect for my life, and I don't have to imitate or mimic anyone else, and when I do, I'm settling for less than what God has called me to. So I I allow myself to be to be mentored. Obviously, I submit myself to authority. That's not what I'm saying, so don't hear this in a a perverted way. There's authority over my life that I submit to. There's people I submit to in mentorship, but I'm not looking to them for the fulfillment of God's plan in my life because I know what they have is unique to them and what God has is unique to me. His gifts are unrevocable in my life. The gifts come without repentance. Can you believe that? He's so generous. He gives you gifts. You mess it up, and he says, no, 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 you can still keep those. I still want to give those to you. It, and I sometimes have to tell myself this. It blesses me to watch God bless other people. Uh, 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 it's a... It's hard to explain, but when I watch other people be blessed by God, I create space for God to show me how I can be blessed. Jealousy does the opposite. When I, if I'm jealous, when I see other people be blessed, I think, man, I wish that would happen to me. That's a spirit of jealousy. It's an honor and a sacrifice to suffer for the gospel. My desire is to genuinely celebrate God's work in other people. Sometimes I have to tell myself that. And I think that's okay. And if you don't, you're like, I'm always celebrating. Shush. No, you're not. You struggle with jealousy just like everybody else. You have to remind yourself. It's your desire to see other people be blessed. It's, It's good to watch other people succeed where you've tried to succeed and failed. It's okay that you're still in process. You have to tell yourself, I will submit to God's love regardless of how I feel. So I want to pray. I want to. I want to. Pr- I understand it's not going to be fashionable for us to do like a big altar call right now. Respond if you're dealing with jealousy, and everyone's going to rush to the altar. Me, help me. It's probably not going to happen. You know, if if you're human, you're going to be like, oh, you know, like maybe I deal with it. I don't know. Ah, I'm fine. The truth is, we all struggle with this. Every single one of us. And I want to pray that we would, we would not just be complacent, not just sit back and like let it roll us over, but we would pray and, and allow God to address any part of our heart that's been dominated by the spirit of jealousy, that's given permission to the demonic to influence our lives, that's allowed selfish ambition to take hold and take root in our lives. So if you'll stand with me as I pray. And again, Merry Christmas. <laughs> what is uh, Macaulay Culkin? Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So if you'll just repeat this in your heart, you don't have to say it out loud, but repeat with me. Lord Jesus, 
I thank you that your plans and your will for my life are good and perfect. I thank you that I am the head and not the tail. I thank you that I am perfectly equipped for what you called me to. And despite how I feel, I will see your work manifest in my life. I bless those you have put around me. I ask that you would bless them. I ask that you would prosper them. I ask that you would give them every good thing that they would need. According to your will, your word, and your goodness. And in the name of Jesus, I break any impure motives from my heart. I break any agreements I have made with the spirit of jealousy. And I pray healing and restoration over any relationships that have been harmed because of it. In the name of Jesus, I declare that your plans are good for my life. We're just going to, it's repetitive, I know. I plan that your will is perfect for my life. I believe it no matter how I feel now. And Father, I repent for becoming bitter in any circumstance where I've seen someone succeed where I wanted to succeed. I release those people now in Jesus' name. Seriously, the altar is open. If you need prayer for anything, jealousy or whatever it is, please come. There's no reason to feel condemned. We're just going to take a moment to worship and pray if you need prayer and allow the Lord to minister to our hearts. Amen.